in the throes of us running out of money twice, that's when we've been our most creative and our most innovative. I'm Angelica Bell. Welcome to the show. Now, whether you're an aspiring startup, a savvy small business, or leading an established enterprise, we'll aim to bring you inspiring stories and fresh knowledge to help you grow with confidence. Join me as I talk to inspiring entrepreneurs and leaders, finding out how they've overcome obstacles and grabbed opportunities to grow a thriving business. You can also catch Holly Mackay and Ashita Cabra Davies on our extra show as they talk about trending issues faced by businesses everywhere. Now, joining me today is Alex DePletch, MBE. She's a tech entrepreneur and business expert, the former CEO of Hassle.com, the revolutionary on-demand cleaning service, and also founder and CEO of Resi, the UK's largest home improvement platform. We're going to be discussing how to seek finance as a startup and continue business growth after initial success and during challenging times. Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Angelica. It's great to be here. To kick things off with every episode, we're going to ask our guest to explain their business entrepreneur story in 60 seconds or less. Do you think you can manage that? 60 seconds is going to be tough. I might have to talk really quick. <laughs> okay, <laughs> your story is a long one. It's like 12 years. Okay, so um, me and my business partner, Jules, um, we always talked about starting our own business when we were consultants at Accenture, but we didn't do anything for a fair few years until we had this idea to become like a local services marketplace. Cue us having zero idea how we were meant to build this thing. She, neither of us could write any code. We didn't know anything about marketing, but we decided to quit our jobs. Jules taught herself to code from a book. I taught myself everything else. We worked at a Royal Festival Hall and then... Um, and we were lucky enough to get into an accelerator. Um, and in there, we ended up pivoting towards um, uh, cleaning only. That's a story I'm sure we'll come to at some point. And then from there, the business just took off and we became Hassle.com, a cleaning marketplace. We grew that from zero revenue to eight million in two years into four countries. We then got bought by um, our German competitor and we exited that business. We said we'd never do that again because I had too much grey hair and it was way too fast. <laughs> but needless to say, six months later, I got this idea for Resi because I wanted to do my own kitchen extension and I found the whole thing. It lacked visualisation. It wasn't digital. It was very analogue. I didn't really understand what I was doing half the time. And it's a quite a long, scary journey. And I turned around to Jules and was like, hey, Jules, I think we can fix this. And she just groaned, went, oh, God, here we go again. <laughs> that was 67. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know it's worked. And I just want to rewind a bit. OK, so obviously with Jules, you co-founded Hassle.com. And you sort of glossed over the fact that you had an £8 million turnover in under two years. Yes. I mean, that is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, it is. <laughs> it is amazing. Can you tell us how you approached investors at the beginning of that journey? Oh, so it was a bit of a pity party, if I'm honest, because um, so we actually joined an accelerator before accelerators became famous and I even knew what one was. So I'd never heard of Y Combinator, which is probably the most famous. And so I remember Googling it and it sort of said university for startups. So we went, we applied to one of the first in the UK called Springboard. We beat 400 other people to get into it. And that's kind of as successful as we were, because once we got into the programme, um, it was really obvious that we, we were kind of flailing around a bit and we were very like determined, but weren't exact. We didn't exactly have a fully formed business, um, and we met a lady called Sarah DeHume. Who um, she turned around to me one day and she said, "Alex, how much will it take you to make sure that this business is still running at the end of this year, which was about seven months' time?" And I said, um, fifty thousand pounds." And I just sort of made it up on the spot. And she went, "Okay, I'll give you fifty thousand pounds." And I was like, "Oh my god!" Just like that. That was really easy. And then well, you got it that you didn't say a hundred thousand. <laughs> yeah, I was like, "Why didn't I up my offer?" <laughs> And then, um, and then uh, this guy called Chris Mares, who was the chair of Magic Pony that sold to Twitter for 150 million in 2016, he rang me up and he was like, "Alex, I really love you and Jules, but I think your business is a, is really, really 
rubbish. And I was like, oh, thanks, Chris. He's like, but because I like you, I'm going to give you £10,000. And I was like, oh, wow, thanks, Chris. So then I had £60,000. And then uh, Neil Davidson gave us £25,000 because he ran a poll and everyone said, who do you like? The, who's going to succeed here? And they're like, the girls, because we were the only good girls on the programme. Not good girls, the only girls. So that's how I raised my first round. And that's as easy as it ever was, because after that, it was downhill from there. Getting the next tranche of money was incredibly difficult. Yeah. So it, so at start, you sort of went for it. Managed to well, get I got that the money. pity vote. Is that, is that what you <laughs> it's, it's not an official term. <laughs> it's what Alex has called it. Yeah. <laughs> FYI. <laughs> but it's worked. And and what I think is really apparent is that you have that determination and drive. And I think that's what many small business have to have in the initial stages, isn't it? Yeah. And make people believe this is worth investing in. Well, and I think that's what I tell a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs because I, I, you know, I see a lot of a lot in my line of work. And um, the one thing that I think people need to realise is when you are setting up a business, you don't, you're not going to have lots of data to prove the concept and, or lots of revenue to demonstrate that you know the business is really viable. So the only thing you really have is you. And so investors are really investing in you and whether they think when your back's against the wall, are you going to be the person that's going to figure out a way out of that? And I guess that's probably what Jules and I have in, in spades is this, we're quite gutsy and determined. And, you know, we knew nothing about the cleaning industry. We didn't, you know, Jules didn't write a line of code before we went into it. And yet she was able, we were able to convince people that like we were going to take on this like really old industry and and succeed. And I think there's, um, that's what you really need to show people is that you are capable and that you've got this great credible story behind you of what you're going to do in, in the field that you've picked. Well, as a founder of a successful tech business, you're competing with some of the largest, biggest, you know, the heavyweights, mm. you know, in that in that genre, how do you negotiate smart terms and conditions and service level agreements with suppliers? What you need to do is you need to bring competitive tension into the process. And the way that you do that is um, by running an incredibly tight um, and very fast process. So let's hypothesise for a second you've got 10 investors or 10 groups of people that you think you might raise money for. You need to split them into three groups. The first that are your number two choice that you would take their money, but you don't really want it that much because they don't bring as much value. The guys that probably are a little bit out of your league that you'll see in your next fundraise and then the guys that you really want. And you hit group one first within a week to two weeks, then group two and then group three. And what happens is by the time you get to the guys that you really, really want, you're pitch perfect. You've got the answer to every single question. Hopefully you've got some term sheets or some offers of investments from the first two groups, the first group that you can then use as leverage because it's very different to say to somebody, oh, hey, would you like to give me £25,000 for my business? And they go, oh, great. Who else is invested? And you're like, uh no one yeah. yet to hey would you like to give me £25,000 and they say well who else well actually I'm in conversations with X, Y and Z and we hope to close in two weeks time suddenly that person that you're approaching really feels that they're going to miss out and that is the art of all of this like I shouldn't say this publicly but investors are like sheep so once they <laughs> sense a good deal they all run after the same ball yes. and that's what you have to do is create that competitive tension even if it doesn't really exist and I guess with what you're saying with A, B and C you've got a backup plan yeah so you know even if you're going for high end you know at the back of your mind it gives you confidence doesn't it, it does yeah we know that other people are interested but you know let's go higher Exactly. And, that, and that's how you walk up the terms. That's how you get a better valuation. That's how you get um, more founder friendly terms. That's how with suppliers, when you're trading one supplier off against the other, you're making them not want to miss out on this deal and therefore give an inch. Because if you've got no leverage, you're really, really in a difficult position. I think from talking to lots of people that one of the things that stops them, one of the biggest hurdles is money. How do startups find their money? Can you tell us the three best tips that have helped you when seeking financing in the tech industry? I think the first thing is that um, investors want to see, or banks, or anyone that you're trying to raise money for, they want to see skin in the game. So I think the first um, the first way I would say to go about it is you need to save up enough money that you've got six month runway in your own life. So you can pay your mortgage or your rent or whatever it is and live reasonably comfortably for six months. And in six months, 
You're either going to know your business works or it doesn't work. And if it works, you'll have data and a story and a narrative to go out and raise further investment. That's the first point. The second point is create competitive tension, which I've already covered. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the third point is never be in a room on your own. So you always need a partner because it's a bit like every good comedy duo. You riff off each other um, and you create confidence that way. So I never pitch on my own. I always pitch with my co-founder or pitch with um, one of my business partners. But it has to be where you have someone watching and reading the room for you. So they're filling in the gaps or the worries or allaying the worries that they see on investors' faces. So they're my top three tips for pitching and raising money. I think Jules needs a good mention here because yeah. I read up about her. She's, you know, she's your long term friend, yeah. business partner. And you both have your strengths and weaknesses because there was a part I read this bit where she was doing the coding, getting on with it, thinking everything was fine. And you were like, oh, my goodness, we've got nothing in the bank. Yeah. <laughs> what, what are we going to do? Yeah. You know, so it's having that yin, yin and yang, isn't mm-hmm. it? Hundred percent. Um, you know, I always say that like Jules prefers coding to people, and she's very data focused. Makes her sound like a total nerd, which she kind of is. No, we love Jules. Yeah, but she's also like the funniest (laughs) person you'll ever meet. And then I'm like this massive extrovert that loves you know big picture thinking, loves people, and so we're like the perfect Venn diagram. And the thing that we share in the middle is is these these core sets of beliefs about the things that we do, like every business having its own uh, mission, and you know, kind of trying to do good on top of earning money and things like that and I think you can never underestimate how important it is to have a partner because they're just like it's like getting married like yeah I've effectively got two two partners my husband and I've got my and Jules who I'm also (laughs) married to at work (laughs) but from your own experience and from what you said you got the money in the first round Mm -hmm. how did you continue to get the money because you said that that process got harder yeah, it, it 100% got harder. So after our first pity round, as I like to call it, um, we then tried to raise a, what what you'd now determine as a seed round, which is like your first um, non-friends and family kind of money into, into a business. Um, and we did it at a really bad time because I got a round together and then George Osborne, the Chancellor at the time, and announced this new tax incentive and we didn't qualify. So all of the investors that were in that round fell away. And this is when we got down to our like last thousand pounds in the bank. And I was like, Jules, like, I think we need to shut up shop and go home. And she was like, no, no, no way. And that's when we did the big pivot to cleaning when we noticed that people coming to the site were looking for cleaners and we didn't have any cleaners. So just so there was a point where you thought, let's forget this. Oh, God. Yeah, I would mean, I like, you know how most women get like super um nervous and they like lose weight because they're not sleeping and then no I just put weight on I eat Chinese and I was just getting bigger and bigger and my husband was like are you all right and it was at that point I was like this is not working for me I was so miserable um and I didn't want to go to work and nothing was working and I just got more and more depressed and that's when I said to Jules like hey I think Mm -hmm. I think this is the end of the road for us and ever the pragmatist she was like no 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 Let's just look at what the data tells us. And I was like, oh God, sod the, the data. Because that's what she always <laughs> says. And anyway, it told us a really interesting story. We looked at all these people that were coming to our site because we originally advertised for everything from gardeners to tutors to cleaners. Like there was like 25 services. And we saw one in four people were looking for a cleaner and we didn't have any cleaners. And that's when we fell about laughing because we were like, that was the aha moment. that Like the light bulb went on. People can't find cleaners. Let's solve that problem. And once we did that, we grew 100% month on month and then raising investment after our, that round had fallen apart after George Osborne introducing the tax um, incentive. That's when we were able to pull it out of the bag and raise our first quarter of a million pounds into the company. So data, looking at the data mm. was vital for you to get the growth in your business yeah 100 percent. because I, d- I think unless you're looking at the data looking at your sales funnel looking at what people do when they come into your business whether that's a website or whether it's you know a shop you don't actually you can't really see what's going on and so then you're, all you're left with is your instinct and nine times out of ten you know what you think is happening is not actually what's happening with the business that you're running now resi mm. how do you ensure that you've got that those assets and that money um, so, you know, Res is an interesting one because people take about 12 months to build or extend their home. And so our cash flow is, is over 12 months. And so what we have to have is very clear indicators of like 
when you know when to expect that money and, and and how long that runway is and so we're always looking at least 12 to 18 months out to know whether we do we need another cash injection if so what does it look like or are we at profitability and what we're going to do with that additional profit how are we going to reinvest that and I think one of the biggest learnings I've had Angelica in business is everybody goes into business like startup or they want to because they want their own autonomy right and their own freedom and they don't, right. want, they, want, they don't they don't want a boss so but what they sometimes lose with that is discipline. So they lose the discipline of what they've learned in their previous company, which is around process and rigor and data. And so governance, company governance is something that we instill from day one in a company to make sure we don't run out of cash and we do know where we're spending money and we're not getting ourselves in trouble. And it's the number one thing that I see upend a lot of startups is then they don't have their eye on that bit because it's boring. <laughs> that, mm-hmm. That's the bit that's the unsexy bit of business. They, they want to be doing the marketing campaigns and the branding and the product releases. They don't want to be looking at the the boring governance stuff and so that's my number one tip for entrepreneurs is get that set up really well in the beginning and it means that you'll always know to a certain degree what levers you have in the business that you can pull so whether or not you're setting up a business for you know online cleaning services to architectural you know help and or stuff, selling shoes or selling shoes yeah. you need to be on top of the data and have governance and control over what you're doing Absolutely. I can't emphasise that enough. It's been one of my biggest learnings because I'm not naturally, as you can probably tell, that way inclined. No, like- I, no I, I would not make any <laughs> assumption because I'm sitting in front of somebody who's got an MBE. So I'm not going to judge you in any shape or form. I'm like, I need what Alex de Pledge has. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> yeah, it's been my, because, you know, that we've we've run out of money nearly run out of money a few times now. So I think we've learned this the hard way because there is nothing worse than that that ball of fear in the pit of your stomach that, you know, you, you're you you're literally out of control and you don't know how to fix it. Um, and we've had that happen to us twice now. And so um, Jules and I are very hot on the governance. But what's also really interesting is like, sometimes you can have too much money and you stop being creative and innovative. So actually in the throes of us running out of money twice, that's when we've been our most creative and our most innovative because our back's been against the walls and we've been forced to take risks that we might not necessarily have done otherwise. I love that you're saying that because sometimes in life, and I think in any walk of life, we always think that person, everything's brilliant. Oh, God, no. You know, they haven't had any stresses or whatever. And, you know, people can be in their own space, doing their own business, working hard, thinking, I can't do this. But but you have to feel sometimes the negative to mm. appreciate those good times, don't you? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I think you learn far more out of failure than you do success. And and actually, it's one of the things I hone down on in interviews when I'm when I'm talking to either investors or I'm talking to prospective employees is, tell me a time when you failed. Because I think if you can't name a, a real personal failure and what you learned from it you probably haven't been trying enough you know what that does by this culture of celebrating failure is kind of glamorizes it like it's an enjoyable process and there is nothing worse in the world than failure but you do learn a lot out of it so it's kind of a double-edged sword and it, you're telling us about your personal struggles that you've had over those years and you're right small businesses and I, I love small businesses I, I have so much admiration for people who who put everything on the line they put everything on the mm. line to make their dream happen or and to, to, you know, have that business they've always dreamt of, be their own boss. And then to suddenly see it possibly disintegrate, yeah. you know, underneath them is scary and, and really sad. Yeah, it's really scary. And I, I think, you know, I, I part of me gets excited about the future because, you know, in uncertainty, there are always opportunities. Like recession is one of the greatest times ever to start a business. So that's my advice. If we do go into recession, get ready, start your business and catch it on the way out. But as someone who's in business with quite a a substantial business now of like 130 people and we're turning over several million, I look at the the next six months and I just have no idea what's going to happen. And that scares me again because I'd just like some firmer footing to be on for just just a few months would be nice. (laughs) So Alex, for people who don't have support from friends or family funding, where can they go to start up and grow and get their business off the ground? This is a really, really good question. 
don't panic if you know you're not from a wealthy background. I think there's first of all lots and lots of local grants. Look at your um, local economic partnership. There are there are many spread around the country, and they do a lot in in terms of helping to support businesses to get off the ground through grants and loans. The government um, has got a centralised body that does exactly the same thing. Then there are massive amounts of angel networks. So these are high net worths that exist across the country that are looking for investment opportunities, and you can go and pitch them. They do check sizes of between five thousand and £100,000. You've then got peer-to-peer crowdfunding, you Crowdcube, Cedars, people like this, where you can put your product and your business idea and, and seek um, funding from, quote unquote, the crowd, which is just like average ordinary people that want to earn a small sliver of your um, product. Um, then you've also obviously got the more kind of well-known and well-trodden paths, which are venture capital, which is like high risk investment. And it can lead from half a million up to, you know, 20 million pounds. Um, n- not a lot of businesses, in my opinion, are suitable for that because you're more looking at software type businesses. Then obviously you've got your more institutional um uh, PE and institutional investors. But I think the, I, I think the bit I take heart from is all of our emphasis in the UK over the last 10 to 15 years has gone into getting startup capital into startup businesses. We're actually really good at that in the UK now. That's why we have so many. We're not so good at the growth funding, but that's another story. So I think if you don't have a lot of money, don't despair. Get onto your local council, your local LEP, or um, start investigating business networks in your local area because they will all have contact into angel networks and um, and funding networks. So all is not lost. And this is what you did. You researched, didn't you? Yeah. You did lots of research. And that's what we're saying. Research, see what's out there to get that support you well, need. And I think you've got, to, it sounds awful, but you've kind of got to be unashamed about putting yourself out there. So hitting up your networking events, not in a, hey, here's my business card, come see my business, but in a, hey, I'm so-and-so and lovely to meet you. What do you do? You know, showing interest in other people. I think... I'm not a good networker. I don't enjoy it. I really don't. But I have an incredible network because I just went out night after night after night meeting as many people because, you know, nine out of 10 people or nine out of 10 events you go to are not going to deliver you anything. But then there's just that one serendipitous event where you meet that future angel or you meet that future hire or you meet that future business partner. And, And that's unfortunately, this is a numbers game and you just have to start pounding the pavements. Any fledging entrepreneurs out there or people thinking yes I want to do this and start my own business how do they make a really impressive investment strategy and pitch okay so the number one thing I think that everybody has to realize is that when you are a small business you're not going to have lots of data and you're not going to have lots of revenue so you're not going to be able to create you know this fancy business model that people can have like complete certainty that you've got it nailed But the one thing you do have is yourself. And so really pitching is all about getting people to buy you and buy your vision of the company. So I think you have to become a really, really good storyteller. So that's my number one um, piece of advice is focus on you, focus on why you and why this opportunity and tell a story around it. Really grab people's attention. Um, The number two thing that I would say is that Everybody thinks that you need lots of money to start a business. And, you know, especially in today's age that you have to be able to have like a website and write some code and do all this stuff. And actually, that is true, but it's not true for the first six to 12 months of your business life cycle. So what you need to do as a second point is run as many um, tests and experiments as you can on your market or on your audience to prove out some assumptions. And you don't need to write any code for that. It might be that you, I don't know. I'm just going to make this up now. You think that um, everybody needs to, um, wants to become a gardener and therefore you want to create an online gardening business where you send seeds through the post with kits and everything, let's just say. Now, some people might run out and they'd be like, right, I need a website. I need to source my suppliers. I need to put some Facebook campaigns up and really... No, you don't, actually. What you need to do is go walk around your neighbourhood and knock on everybody's door and give them a packet of seeds with your little kit and say, try this out for a week and when I come back, I'm going to get some I, I'm get some feedback. You start that small. Like, it really doesn't take that much. It, I always like to say, like, remember when you were in, like, high school and there was always, like, that kid that would have, like, some marble racket in the toilets or like (laughs) someone would be coming with his satchel full of sweets right think like that basic and that's how you prove out the assumptions of your business so storytell 
all about you and prove out some experiments so that you can talk really, like you can demonstrate that you know your market and you've done as much work as possible without having oodles of cash. And if you can do both of those things and then sell a big vision of like why this can make lots of money and that this would be a really good investment for someone, you just won't fail to raise money because there's lots of money out there right now just waiting to be put into really good entrepreneurs and good businesses. Fantastic advice. Start small. Get mm-hmm. that little seed. And and also, you know, all those times people would be laughing at those children selling sweets in the tuck shop. Most of them have come successful yeah. businesses. I know, I have 100%. <laughs> what is the one piece of advice you live by? I know, I know this, I could talk to you all day, but we've got to wrap things up. <laughs> oh God, it's so cliche. Um, I think probably, um, and it's cliche because I always say it and I need to come up with a better one. But I think I've always lived by the um, philosophy that I will ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Um, And because I think ultimately, a lot of the time, if you ask someone, is it okay if I, they will find a reason that it's not okay. Whereas actually, if you do it, and it goes wrong, and you say, look, I'm really sorry, this is what I'll do to fix it, you're probably gonna have a far better outcomes in life. Yeah, because unless someone's got the same vision as you, they're not gonna see it. No. And again, it's that bias to action. Alex, thank you so much. You are so inspiring and good luck with the future. Thank you so much. I love it when things are like really good fun. Yeah, and also, but education and learning and inspiring and you are superb. Thank you. Now, next week, join Holly and Ashita on our extra show as they discuss funding for growth in challenging times, plus actionable steps you could take. And if this episode has inspired you, head to our website to find out more insights and potential solutions that could help you take action today. Until next time.